Good morning, YouTube. So I am here with the fantastic and knowledgeable Mr. Josh Wiggins. I'm kind of underselling it a little bit, but let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to talk all things building muscle. So we asked you guys on Instagram, on both our Instagram handles. If you're not following us, I'm going to put the links below. So make sure you do that first and foremost. And we're going to be talking all things building muscle. So people have sent us questions in. We've chosen our favorite questions. The one that we think we're going to get you the most value. We've had a couple of funny questions in there because they were just hilarious to put in there. We love uh, it. Yeah, they're going to be interesting. So we're going to basically just talk to you about building muscle and how to optimize hypertrophy or actually building muscle tissue. So we're going to jump straight to some questions. Uh, uh, should we go into yours first on my Let's jump back and forth and start with yours. All right, so the first question that I've got is the best rep range to build muscle. So what do you right. So if we're keeping it within a shorter window, I would say if I could only pick one rep range, I really like between five and eight. I think this is a really good figure, a good window to be building both strength and muscle. And I think that we need to build both simultaneously. So the intensity or load that you need for any exercise in the five to eight rep range is challenging enough to build muscle and it's pushing that boundaries of strength. So over a course of a six to 10 week program sticking in that rep range, you should see gains in both of those. And enhanced strength means uh, the ability to lift heavier loads for higher rep ranges later on in your training program. So if I could only pick one, I would say five to eight, but in saying that, I think you shouldn't limit yourself. We need all rep ranges over a period of a training year. Yeah, no, I like that. It definitely, I, I'd agree with Josh if you were to say we're just one rep range and then we got to look at out, outside of that spectrum if we're looking over a you know, 12, 16, 24 week block or something. I like personally working within a 8 to sort of 15 rep range, even as high as 20 and plus, depending on the muscle group. I mean, the quads have even been shown to grow for 50 rep range. Max, like if you look at cyclists, like they're yeah. just constant repetition, repetition, repetition. And it's painful as shit. Yeah, exactly right. But looking at uh, sort of growth, we need a few things. We need mechanical tension, we need metabolic stress, and we need muscle damage. I mean, mechanical tension, we're looking at trying to generate as much force against a load as possible. Um, metabolic stress, looking at maintaining tension throughout the whole uh, movement, so an increasing blood flow, essentially that that pump affects what we're looking for when we're looking at metabolic stress, and then muscle damage, uh, which uh, we're going to go into another question actually, yep. but from my understanding is created mainly over the eccentric range of the, yeah, of the, the movement. The uh, time and attention, so all of those things feed into each other, so you're going to, we kind of need all of those three things over the course of a training plan, as you said, in order to build muscle or to maximize your results, um, and you're absolutely right, like all rep ranges can and in fact will influence muscle growth provided that diet and everything else is accounted for. Um, and yeah, as I said, you, you can build rep lifting one uh, muscle lifting in the one to three rep range. It's still important. You're still going to be working those heavier, stronger, harder contracting muscle fibers. And the same token, you can be building type two, uh, sorry, type one fibers in like the twenty plus rep range. So everything's important, and it's important that you kind of get a periodized plan. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with both stances there. Perfect. All right. Your first question, Johnny. Uh, so building on that, it was how much does tempo matter? and uh, specifically in the eccentric phase, so the lowering phase of any lift. So you think of a squat, it'd be going down, if you think of a bench press, lowering the weight down, or a lat pull down for something opposite, it'd be as the weight stretches up. Um, and tempo does matter, definitely plays a huge role in muscle building, but I think what's more important is actually sustaining and building tension over that tempo. Because without tension, I think tempo is pretty pointless. Yeah, absolutely, as just sort of said, like we try and maximize the time with the tension, which is key for hypertrophy and muscle growth. But if you have an inability to contract your muscle throughout the entirety of the range, then tempo doesn't mean anything. You can do 10 second eccentrics. It's not going to matter if you can't actually stimulate that muscle. Yep, definitely. So a really um, easy takeaway example for you, and you could try this right now, is just think of a bicep curl. So very easy to conceptualize and do. So if I was going to say a three second negative, I could do this all day. If I was going to do this with tension, so really squeezing the muscle on as hard as I can and then lowering for three seconds while maintaining tension, so one, two, three, I'd be lucky to get 10 to 12 reps even just with my arm maintaining that really heavy tension. So get that tension and execution first and then you can apply the tempos. Um, so going into the eccentric loading, once you've got the tension, so presuming that's already taken care of, it's super important for that mechanical damage that we're speaking about, so actually creating those little micro traumas in the muscle tissue that we use our nutrition and recovery strategies to repair, regrow, recover. Um, it's essential for muscle growth. You need to challenge yourself and the eccentric loading portion of any lift is one of the best ways to do that. You just want to flex your bicep that, yeah? Yeah, definitely. You want to see it? <laughs> um, 
Hopefully the audio is good, guys. It is a little bit windy here, but I do have a wind sock on the camera, which is the complete opposite to a cop sock. He does yeah, I was going to say, he's uh, used it for multiple <laughs> things. I don't want to touch it after this. <laughs> uh, so hopefully the audio is okay. So next question, look at how many times per week does a body part have to be trained? So it really depends on how you train it. I like to aim for twice a week. Uh, I think obviously so long as you control for volume and intensity, so you don't want to be training. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to be training, say, let's just choose chess. You don't want to train chess for three hours on a Monday and then three hours again on a Thursday. If you're doing half an hour of something, really good quality workout, and then you do half an hour again two or three days later. Um, I think aiming for two times a week or even three times every fortnight has shown for myself and a lot of my clients to be of most benefit. So frequency with a controlled level of volume and intensity. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. At least like two, three times a week. A lot of the people I think do struggle, uh, if, especially if you're just going to focus on one body part um, per day, like you got a back day or a chest day, it's very hard to get enough frequency. You be tra unless you want to train for like three or four hours. If you do have that time, go nuts. But most people don't, and it's not the most productive way to be able to build muscle tissue by just focusing on a back day or a chest day. Again, unless you have a lot of time on your hands, which most people, um, most people don't. But then again, I guess it goes on. On the goal, like what's the priority? If you want to prioritize chest, then you should probably train it a little bit more. I know a lot of females, a lot of my clients want to prioritize glutes. So with glutes, we train them three, four times a week, at least. Yeah. I would say as frequently as you can recover from. Yeah. And as Abby said, if the goal is muscle growth, which is this, what this question and answer is about, I wouldn't train on a bro split of being chest one day, back another day, shoulders another day, legs another day. I would like to see either upper, lower body, a push, pull, lower split, so kind of, putting muscles or grouping muscles together that work synergistically in a workout and that will allow for you to get in those two or three sessions per week or fortnight depending on the intensity of your training um, so you can actually get that frequency and that stimulus that is going to elicit the growth response that you're after. Beautiful. All right, your question. Okay, one of our favorite questions of the day. <laughs> Smoking weed post-workout, is this beneficial for muscle growth? So. Abby can talk from anecdotal experience, I can't. <laughs> uh, I can't, but... In my opinion, will. not that we've tried it, you may have, <laughs> I haven't. Um, I'm high now. Yeah, and we both are actually, it's not post-workout, that's what I mean. I could actually see a lot of benefit here. Um, so, one thing that's super important, so the most important thing for muscle growth, is that recovery phase and getting into what's called the parasympath uh, parasympathetic nervous system, so your PNS which is that rest and digest state. It just sounded like you said penis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get in there. Um, so your rest and digest and growth recovery state. So you need to be relaxed. And if you leave the gym like all wired and fired up from your pre-workout or that extra shot of coffee that you had before you went, you're not really in an optimal state for growth and recovery from the workout that you just did. Plus the intensity of the workout's gonna get you a little bit shaky and overstimulated. So doing something, uh, meditation, breathing, smoking weed, can help to like kind of flick that switch and get you over into that parasympathetic and rest and digest state and that recovery state is essential for growth um, on top of that calories are essential for growth and i have heard that smoking weed will give you that <laughs> munchy state so if you're getting in more calories and they're coming from good quality foods and you relax i can see that as a good recipe for growth probably not the first thing i'll recommend to my clients um, it might be okay. Yeah, I think it's one of those interesting ones. That I don't think there's many um, like negative side effects to it. So it's one of those, like, if you are a heavy like weed smoker, then there's not going to be nothing detrimental to it for as far as our experience goes, especially no. not as much as mine. I mean, I've seen uh, competitors, I've taught a lot of bikini competitors specifically, and I've seen girls smoke weed like the night before just to chill the hell out, calm the nerves down a little bit, because if you are going to go into competition and you're just, you're in a sympathetic state, it's the opposite of the penis, the parasympathetic. <laughs> So, smoking weed might be a great idea. We all love that scene on Pumping Iron with Arnold sitting back. Arnold is numero uno t-shirt, just puffing on a joint there. So, work for Arnold. You've got so pretty big arms. So, it might work for you. <laughs> Smoke weed. <laughs> Alright, so next question we're going to look at is, is it better to bulk first, especially if you are holding on to a little bit of body fat, to bulk first, optimize muscle growth? Obviously, yes, we need to be in a surplus regardless to build a good quality amount of muscle or do you cut first, get lean, and then bulk? 
from my experience and my opinion, I think it's actually better to start off lean. Um, we need to optimize the body's hormones, so we're talking things like testosterone, estrogen, insulin, ghrelin, and leptin. These are things that influence our appetite, mood, our ability to recover from workouts, how lean we are. Uh, are we going to be storing more body fat or less body fat? Um, being in a, a quite lean body without being like five or six percent, you know, we're talking around like anywhere from seven to twelve percent for a male and ten to fifteen percent for a female, which is still quite lean without being like based on your photos or you could go and get a DEXA scan but I think this is a good starting point and then you can start to add those calories in from food that works for you um, and just build lean body tissue rather than bulking up and adding a lot of body fat and then having to strip right back and, and losing a lot of your gains so I'd rather slowly acquire lean tissue over time I think this is much easier to maintain it's much easier to hang on to when you have to have off periods from the gym um, and I think you can build a really good physique from that point yeah no I completely agree I've got Getting lean first is also good because you get lean and you're going to look a little bit bigger as well and you feel better um, rather than, again, like, as Josh said, just getting fat because as you get fatter, you just feel fucking horrible. Um, speaking for experience, you just feel awful. Um, but also if you're looking at, yeah, looking at your substrates, you're looking at things like your energy substrates, like your carbs and fats and protein, the way they're going to be distributed around the body, if your body's really accustomed to storing a lot of fat because you're eating already in so much of a surplus, it's going to be more accustomed to that. So when you're going to a cup, for example, it's used to storing a hell of a lot rather than burning a hell of a lot. But if we look at trying to get lean first, the, um, I guess the substrates, the distribu distribution is going to be much more effective in that you're going to be opting for um, burning uh, glucose and, and, and fat rather than trying to store a hell of a lot. Yeah, and just on top of that, I guess one thing that we try to preach is like a minimum effective dose. So if you're used to eating a ton of calories already to be at the physique that you're at now, and then you're trying to grow some more, eventually you're gonna have to be eating a million meals a day and 10, 100,000 million calories just to put on weight. So by stripping back to being lean, you can slowly add in those calories so that your body can grow from what you're giving it. Then when you stop growing, add a little bit more. Grow there, stop growing, add a little bit more. So you're always giving that minimum effective dose to elicit the desired response um, and you don't have to be eating absurd amounts of food that A, we can't afford, B, our digestive system is going to be totally screwed up from. So it's a good starting point, definitely in that lean phase. We should probably point out though, when you are trying to put on weight, so this probably applies, it applies to both men and women, but probably easier for men to hear than women. If you're trying to put on a maximum amount of muscle, at some point you're not going to look as lean as you eventually want to, and that's okay. Um, we don't want to start at that point, but eventually you are going to put on some mud. You might not be able to see your abs for a little while while you're trying to get to that sort of end goal or that end uh, desired physique or weight that you want, but that, that will come later on in the piece. So I think um, psychologically you need to learn to let go of that leanness just a little bit when you're getting to that top end range of your body's maximum weight or size before you start to skip back. So start lean, you may accumulate some body fat on the way, but you're, more than, uh, you're less likely to end up Keep the end goal in mind, like what's you know, 12 weeks of building muscle tissue or losing your abs for you know the, the end product, the, the stage. Exactly. You know, you're sweet. Hi, uh, your question. Okay, so best exercises for arm growth. Now, King of Arms here is gonna start us off on this one. What do you So like? do you know I think this applies to I guess any body part as well as arms? Like we look at uh, the types of contraction we go through, we're looking at uh, the stretch portion of the movement on the strength curve, we're looking at the stretch, we're looking at the mid-range, and we're looking at the peak. So if we're to, as an example, Here we look go. at the stretch, so we're looking at a 45 degree incline bench, obviously they're not the best positioning, but we're looking at here, trying to get the bicep to the most stretched position that we can, working it from there, you're gonna tap into X amount of motor units here. Then we're looking at mid-range from here, another different pool of motor units, then we're looking at the stretch, which is right up here, so preacher curl or a little bit higher. So to optimize growth in any muscle, you've got to be hitting all those parts of the strength curve. Otherwise you're missing out on so much. And you, if you look at a lot of people when they do say like partial reps, they're true there. It's great, like great, you're, you're doing a, one of the biggest things here is, um, is metabolic stress, you're pulling that blood flow. 
but you're only working the muscle through part of the strength curve, only a very, very small part. Will your legs, for example, your biceps get huge and full of blood and you'll feel good and get a nice little eagle? List? Fuck yeah, you will. However, to optimize growth, you're missing out on so fucking much. So much. I, I totally agree with that. I think when people come to train arms, and I'm not sure about Abby, but I never train arms on their own in the same day. I think that could be a wasted workout where you could be hitting other body parts so you can group them with chest or shoulders or back or break up biceps with back and triceps with chest or shoulders, however you like to do it. I wouldn't really dedicate a whole day to arms. And I think just picking two or three key exercises to work on and just executing them really well. So maybe one exercise in that stretch position, one in the contracted position, and one that works you really hard right the way through. I think most of us are pretty good in the mid range. I think it's the extremes of the range we're lacking. So for biceps, choosing an exercise, maybe like a Zotman curl or something that starts off behind you. So your shoulders in an extended position and your biceps are in a position of stretch. So something that's really hard in that portion, obviously going through the full range of motion, squeezing at the top. Uh, a, a normal barbell curl, something that's going to work you pretty hard from top to bottom as long as you're really contracting as hard as you can at the bottom, uh, at the top, sorry, and maintaining that tension the whole way through. And then something that's going to get the biceps in a really short position. So as Abby said, like a, a dumbbell preacher curl or even a machine preacher if your gym has one that kind of lines up with your biomechanics really well. For triceps, we're looking at the same thing. Something that allows you to be stable, so pushing your shoulder blades into something or allowing you to keep them locked. Um, and therefore something that's going to be working in a stretched, mid-range and short position. So again, two, three exercises, you can do that. Um, and just contract the hell out of each muscle that you're trying to train. That's probably the number one thing. Yeah. Uh, in terms of arms, one of the limitations that I see or probably training issues is that people just like to chase a pump when it comes to arm day. So you just want to be doing like 15, 20, 25, 30 reps, which can be great, but not all the time. I think um, for a lot of people, like you might be training, say you love chest day and you want to do sets five by five on bench and you've noticed that your pecs grow really well and respond really well to five by five, you should probably try that for your biceps. Chances are they're going to respond the same as your pecs do. If five by five works for you, it's probably going to work for you all over your body. So make sure that you work a variety of rep ranges for your arm and that you execute really well in each of those rep ranges. Perfect. All right, so next question. This is one that we've actually been discussing lately, but uh, protein intake adjustment to maintain lean muscle whilst cutting. So this is you, Josh, you're the foremost expert on this with nutrition. So it's a bit of debate that we've spoken about, not between us necessarily, but in the fitness community. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that protein intake actually needs to be higher when cutting than when bulking. When you are bulking, you already have a caloric surplus. There's probably no chance that you're going to be burning muscle tissue. You're going to maintain that regardless because you have a high amount of carbs and fats in the system. So one gram of protein per pound of body weight or 2.2 grams per kilo, if you want to use that formula, it seems to work really well. There's nothing to kind of disprove that. When you're cutting, I'd be raising it to like 1.5 grams per pound of body weight or what's that, about three grams per kilo. Um, I want to keep that protein intake higher so that we do not risk sacrificing any muscles as carbohydrates and fat calories become to reduce. So as you're in that uh, caloric deficit, our goal is to maintain as much muscle as possible so you can show what you've worked really hard for all through the bulking and maintenance season. Uh, so we don't want to sacrifice any muscles. So I would be raising probably by anywhere from 20 to 50% what you have been taking for your bulking portion of your training. Um, and maintaining that high level of protein as the other two macronutrients begin to deplete. That's how I would. I think a lot of people have a misconception saying that obviously yes, we've got our pro, uh, your uh, sorry your fats and carbohydrates are your primary source of energy, but protein and amino acids can also be used as a source of energy. Not half as efficient, but they can. So eventually, when you're going into your cut, uh, as your glycogen and your and your fat start to get depleted, at some stage your body's going to need a little bit more energy. So it's going to happily tap into yeah. amino acids into your lean muscle tissue. But the higher, as Josh said, the higher that rate is, we can preserve as much lean tissue as you possibly can. Otherwise, you're just going to get really lean and really skinny, and the whole bulk is probably just fucking pointless. You may as well have just gone really lean and just stayed skinny like a scarecrow. <laughs> I'm right into that. Yeah, no, neither am I. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. All right, your question? My question was pre and post exercise nutrition. So what is ideal in terms of muscle growth? So for me, pre-workout, I like to finish my meal about 90 minutes before training. And I start off with that because I get that question so often. How long before training should I be eating my meal? 
I do see people pull up at the gym, finish a meal and go straight into the gym and start training, which is not ideal. You have a lot of blood in your digestive system trying to digest the foods that you've just eaten and extract the nutrients from it. And at the same time, you're trying to tell the body to send blood to your biceps so you can get a farm board to your legs so you don't die during a set of squats. It's, it's just not going to work. So I would say 60 minutes minimum, 90 minutes is probably optimal to consume your pre-workout meal before training. I like a good mix of moderate uh, GI carbohydrates, so something like a sweet potato, some healthy fats, so whether it's like olive oil, coconut oil, avocado, depending on what's in season, if you are going to go like the avocado route or some sort of raw nuts, um, and then a lean quality protein. So a really good simple meal would be something like a chicken thigh or chicken breast, steak, red meat if you like it, with some avocado and some sweet potato. Obviously the portion size will depend on your current weight, your goal weight, what workout you are doing. Post-workout, I kind of keep the fats to a minimum for that initial meal, and I keep the uh, carbohydrates and protein quite high, so something that's going to digest really quickly, um, whether that's a shake, so some sort of lean whey protein and dextrose, like a carbohydrate that's going to absorb and digest really quickly, because we're trying to get those nutrients straight back into the system, or if you don't want to go the supplement route, which is completely fine, you don't need to go the supplement route at all, a lean protein, so like a lean chicken breast or a lean red beef mince, with something that digests really fast, like a white rice, a jasmine rice, and again, quantities will depend on you, your size, your goals, and what you just trained. No, yeah, I completely agree. Completely agree. Like you, pre-workout, the the goal is having something that your body can handle that can optimize performance in the gym. That's the goal of the pre-workout nutrition. Then post-workout recovery. So again, your body needs to be able to handle that in your digestive system. As Josh said there, like trying to eat too early is just not efficient. I know myself, for example, mine's at least two hours to digest at least. My yeah. digestive system is not very fucking efficient, which yeah. sucks, but it's not. So it's at least two hours that you're leaving. Sometimes even depending on what I have, up to four hours. Yeah. I need, that's how, I, how long I need. So I need to give myself that amount of time to digest food so I feel comfortable and I can actually go in and train really, really hard. That's a good point there is just get to know your body. Um, you can keep a food log for yourself. So if you eat something, you write down an hour later, I felt really good, I felt like I could go and train now, and you can stick to that formula for a while. Um, the other thing is if you're getting a really good pre-workout meal in, you don't need any intra-workout supplementation. In my opinion, you should have enough nutrients in your system to fuel that workout, and then you're going to be eating not long after the workout, so you're gonna be replenishing. So the idea of intra-workout nutrition may not be as important or necessary if you've nailed the pre and post-workout windows. Is it my question or yours? It's on you. All right. Um, I think we actually touched on this one, that one there, the optimal split for high yeah. So we can sack that one off. Yeah. Um, how to get high protein or enough protein in your diet without using supplements? That's a good, good question. And I do use protein supplementation because it's convenient for me, but in no way is it necessary. So I like to have a variety of foods and it really depends on kind of foods that agree with you, but I, for myself, like chicken, I like lean chicken breast and also chicken thigh, which is a little bit fattier, but I have no problems consuming fatty meats. I think that we need those calories. Um, I like lean fish and fatty fish, so white fish or salmon. Um, and I really like ground beef or minced beef, so minced grass-fed red beef, like quite a lean one, so like 90% lean, 10% fat, um, and just consuming them frequently. So I like to eat four times a day, and get some combination of each of those. So, you know, one meal, for example, this my last rest day, I'll just give you the protein sources that I ate on my last rest day. I had eggs for breakfast, I cooked salmon for lunch because I never eat salmon, and I was like, you know what, this week I'm gonna spoil myself and get some salmon. I had a lean grass-fed red beef mince for like an afternoon tea or meal three, and then for dinner I had chicken thigh. Um, so I had four meals a day, which works really well for me. No need for protein powder, and I just mix those with some uh, high quality carbohydrates and some healthy fats and protein in, uh, intake was ticked off. So well, I didn't get a fucking invite to the uh, the food fest that you had four days away for the for the rest of the day. But anyway, we move on. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think Josh hit the nail on the head with, with everything. It's not overly complex. It's really not that fucking hard. 
especially even if you get into three grams per kilo of body weight, like you just increase the amount of protein that you're eating. So if you're eating 150 grams of cooked chicken breast, that would probably increase to 180 or 200 or 210 or whatever it might be. Don't You don't have to now change the sauce completely. You just increase what you're already having. Because again, looking at digestion, you need to be able to consume and absorb these foods. But if you're going, okay, now I need to increase my protein intake, what has more protein? Oh, now I need to change it to turkey or to egg whites or whatever it might be. Just stick to what you're already eating. You know what works for you. Just exactly. increase your amounts. Just don't overthink it. Yeah. Like, so you just have to choose the foods that agree with your body. And what I mean by that is foods that you notice you don't get any bloating, you don't have any joint pain, you get a good quality of sleep, stress levels are down. You will know which ones just feel good to eat. Like it might sound silly, but it's innate knowledge telling you this food is good for my body. I should stick with this food. Um, you're allowed to have variety, you're allowed to choose other sources and see if they work for you. You can switch things around all the time if you really want to. Um, but as Abby said, you really need to find how much protein you're taking in in the day and just increase your intake of the sources that you already enjoy if your protein needs increase over time. So you don't need to have a protein supplement, it is a convenience tool. So if you are working long hours and you, you seriously, you know, literally can't stop for two minutes to eat a meal, then yeah, maybe protein powder is going to be good for you, but it's not a necessity to achieve your goals. Do you have any more questions? I don't have any more questions. Neither do I. Any closing thoughts? Anything to, to sign off with, to let the viewers know? Uh, I would like people to comment and just say, we both showed our biceps during this. <laughs> executing your exercise as well you're eating healthy and you're giving good attention to recovery so sleeping meditating smoking weed if that's what you want to do do it as long as you're hitting the nail on all of those heads you don't have to make it an overcomplicated science just stick to the basics and you'll have really good results awesome and if you do need any help with that guys leave a comment below and we're more, more than happy to answer any questions or you can just drop us a dm on our instagram which seems to be how most people communicate with us so more than welcome to do that too and i just want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to watch Definitely. me and josh ramble on for yeah. the it's gonna be a fucking long vlog this is gonna be like 30 minutes long people love it perfect you can listen to it while you're working out yeah There's a little bit of audio or something like that you don't necessarily have to watch you can just download the episode and just listen to it exactly and yeah. if you're doing cardio a lot of people do their 30 40 minutes since the cardio list uh, leading into a show listen to it while you do your cardio yeah perfect guys so much more fun Oh, it will, yeah. I did mine this morning and it sucked. But watching the YouTube video was just way more entertaining. Definitely. So, thank you so much, guys. If you've not already, please subscribe, hit that like button, and have a great day.